Hi, my name is Alexandra Ainsworth, and I am here at Sensibly Sexy um, to talk to you a bit about my debut novel, um, The Duke in Denial, and I will also read an excerpt from it for you. So The Duke in Denial is a male-male Regency romance. And I discovered Regency Romance um, shortly after I arrived in England. Um, it was a very rainy day, um, and I guess you can, you know, I was coming from the U.S., um, and, and clearly I was not prepared to at all the weather. So, you know, clearly this is still early in my stay, my um, stay here, and I took shelter from the rain at a library and discovered all these amazing books by people like um, Julia Quinn and Julie Ann Long, um, books that were, you know, a bit lighthearted and that reminded me of, you know, the screwball comedies that I liked growing up, you know, the, you know, the 1930s musicals, and, and I, you know, I used to adore P.G. Woodhouse as well. Um, but these, you know, Regency set historicals also, you know, dealt with very real emotions and, um, you know, sometimes serious topics like PTSD and, you know, coming back from the Napoleonic Wars, for instance. Um, I, I also like many subgenres of romance, um, but certainly male male romance is certainly one of my, you know, very favorite. I think as a reader, it's quite. It's even more interesting to read when the two main characters have a you know a very good reason of you know keeping them apart. It's not just a misunderstanding or poor communication. It's you know, in I mean, in early nineteenth century England, if um, you know, I think homosexual wasn't even a word back then, and if you were caught in an act of sodomy, you could be you know executed, <laughs> and you know that's that's quite horrible. I mean, going to prison or being tarred and feathered would be, you know, lighter punishments, you know, if they're, if they're going easy on you. Um, so certainly, um, I, th I think many people back then um, might, you know, wouldn't really have known um, that, it, you know, that it was even possible um, to have a relationship um, with a you know person of the same gender, um, if they you know maybe they would have met some people at school, but you know who had similar inclinations, but you know maybe not, maybe they weren't in in that group of of people. Um, maybe the only way they would have heard about such a thing, you know, was from their their minister, you know as a, a list of the things that you're not supposed to do and and certainly Sebastian, you know, the main character in the in the book, he you know, he just wants to be a really good person. So so he might have thought, well, you know, I, I'm I'm a good person or I'm trying to be a good person. So, you know, of course I won't do that, you know, thing that, you know, the you know, the church and society is, is, is saying is, you know, a really bad thing. Um, the other main character of the book does know himself a, a bit better. He's coming back from war um, in India. He's an, an injured um, captain um, returning to London, and he's more conscious that you know the world can actually be you know life can be short, and and maybe the best thing is you know to take advantage of the possibilities when you know when you're still around. Um, Sebastian, though he's um, he's recently become a duke. His he never was planning to. Um, it's, it's never been something he you know he thought about or prepared for. Um, his uncle died, and then his his cousin, who was supposed to be the heir, um, also died under mysterious circumstances. And this was you know down in Sussex, and Sebastian's living in Yorkshire, and he's you know he doesn't even know. Um, you know, he's never even visited, um, you know, where the estate is, and suddenly he has, you know, all these immense responsibilities, you know, all these, you know, people he has to take care of, not just, you know, his family, his aunt, whom he still adores, you know, his aunt who's still mourning her late husband's passing, um, but, you know, 
all the people who work for him as well. Um, so he, you know, he goes to London and he's on his way to meet his, you know, his new bride that his aunt has, you know, selected for him because of course, you know, now he'll, you know, now that he's Duke, he'll, you know, need to get an heir. And, um, you know, Sebastian was actually married before, but, um, but his wife um, died shortly after, um, so, you know, he's, he's really been by himself um, in New Yorkshire um, for, the, for the past few years, and he's still quite young, he's in his, he's still in his 20s. Anyway, I am going to read um, an excerpt of the first scene for you, so it's London, 1804. So, Sebastian Lewis prayed his top hat wouldn't be swept away. Tonight, Aunt Beatrice would introduce him to the woman he would marry, and arriving hatless was decidedly not how he desired to make an entrance. Perhaps Yorkshire country squires darted about lacking essential wardrobe items, but Sebastian was a duke now, and he needed to act properly. Somerset Hall depended on him. Crisp wind buffeted his face, and fallen leaves elevated and danced around his legs. He pulled his hat tighter and hurried along the perimeter of Hyde Park. The flickering flames of whale oil lamps glinted off the windows of surrounding buildings and suffused the area with a fishy odor. Few pedestrians strolled the streets. The wind and prospect of rain likely dissuaded all but those with pressing business. Carriages passed, their decorations growing increasingly elaborate, with golden crests and brightly painted wheels as he neared the festivities. He would marry whomever his aunt chose. He never understood why some people agonized over the decision, even marrying for love and breaking ties with their family. He had never met a woman who inspired him to do that. It was so gratifying to do what was right and make his family happy. What could top that pleasant sensation? Not that he felt pleasant now. Perhaps that would come later. Instead, his chest tightened and his stomach quivered. Towering red brick homes loomed around him as he approached his aunt's townhouse in Grosvenor Square. Dark smoke puffed from chimneys. A soldier in a scarlet uniform ambled down the street, his powerful form moving in confident strides. Sebastian forced his attention away, instead focusing on the sounds of a well-tuned violin drifting from an open window. He craned his neck to examine the building, and a gust of wind lifted his hat off his head. It soared into the starry sky. He raised his hand, his stomach already dropping. His top hat sailed across the street. He hurried one step behind, conscious of how fully she must appear to all the people riding by in carriages. The hat flew off, flew into the square, and he rushed across the road. Get off the street, fool, a hackney driver shouted, his cockney accent amplifying the abuse of words. Sebastian winced. The top hat didn't cooperate, and caught in a high branch taunting him. He clenched his jaw and shook the tree with his cane, bathing himself in a shower of dry leaves. The hat refused to fall. People must have spotted him running after it, and the thought of now appearing at the ball without his hat appalled him. Climbing in an evening dress was perhaps not advisable, but he only needed to reach the next branch, and then he would be able to grasp the elusive beast. He exhaled, relieved to have a plan. He could accomplish this. He clambered up the trunk and swung his hand over to the lowest bough. Getting a firm grip, he shifted his weight. Now he only needed to move his other arm to the branch, and then he could pull himself up. He'll not get it down like that. A rich northern accent broke through the darkness, shattering the night. The melodic voice swept away all memory of the staid, polished voices of the time and ushered Sebastian to a hilltop where missing hats didn't cause alarm. He tried to find the owner of the voice, momentarily forgetting his precarious position. His shoulders relaxed and his hat and slipped. He dangled one-handed, his feet kicking in the air, lacking the earlier support of the trunk. He cursed. He could still swing up, but would risk tearing his clothes, and showing up at the ball with torn clothing would be impossible. He glanced down at the ground, scattered with leaves, twigs, and roots. He suspected he would find himself there soon. Something moved in the darkness, and an upturned face appeared below. You startled me. 
Sebastian frowned and swayed on the branch, unsure whether to just drop down or try to climb up. Both options would lead to negative repercussions for his apparel. The man laughed. I think you need help. He's doing just fine before you came, Sebastian muttered. He might be athletic, but tree hanging was not a common occupation for him. He lifted his other arm. If he swung, Sebastian fell. He maintained some dignity by landing on both feet his attire intact. Unfortunately, that dignity was mostly achieved because of the strong arms that caught him on his way down, steadying him. He took note of the long fingers that still grasped his waist. He leaned against the man's chest and a surge of warmth filled him. Too much warmth. He swiveled, facing the stranger and creating some distance between them. He forced himself to steady his breath. Light from the nearby townhouses illuminated his view. A tall man with dark curly tendrils and warm brown eyes stared at him. Broad shoulders filled his uniform, and Sebastian's gaze lingered on the man's chiseled features resting on his strong jaw. His heart raced and his breath caught, overwhelmed by an inappropriate desire to trace the faint stubble. He forced himself to avert his eyes and concentrated on the exquisite buttons and gold thread adorning the man's attire. He inhaled. The man smelled, smelled wonderful, like pine needles, like Christmas garlands and all things good. Horses' hooves pattered on the cobblestone, signaling the arrival of a new group of guests. The man's eyes darted through the street. He stepped away and straightened his uniform. Partygoers trickled into the townhouse, the women lifting the hems of their dresses to avoid selling them. The officer swooped down and picked up a stone. He grimaced for a moment and transferred the rock to his left hand. The piece of granite shimmered in the moonlight. I've always found when fastening a rock, a, a tree, a rock is the best weapon. Sebastian struggled to find words. Are you saying the tree is Goliath? If that means I can be David. Amusement filled the man's voice as he approached the tree. Sebastian's heart pounded, no doubt rivaling the sound of the horse's hooves. You are too big to be a proper David. The man grinned, and heat brushed to Sebastian's cheeks. Surely the man did not think he referred to Michelangelo's statue. Nevertheless, I shall conquer the tree. The man threw a stone at the branch. The top hat slid off, toppling toward the ground, and the stranger caught and passed it to him. Sebastian drew in his breath and ran his fingers against the hat's felted beaver fur. Relief surged through him, and he exhaled. Thank you. Trust the experience has not harmed you? Sebastian shivered at the pleasing tone of the man's deep voice. He shook his head, ever conscious of the stranger's wide shoulders marked by gold and epaulets. The man stepped near, and his feet rustled the leaves. Whom do I have the pleasure of meeting? Sebastian paused, not wanting to share his name. The man might recognize it, and he didn't want the man's demeanor to change. Most people acted differently once they found out he was a duke. Something about the vast amounts of money and land. But Sebastian. The man beamed and his body straightened under the soft glow of the moonlight. He looked regal. And I'm William. Sebastian averted his gaze. His heart pounded as he became conscious that he was now on a first-name basis with this stranger. You're an officer, Sebastian said, staring at William's chest. Indeed, you're quite observant. Blood rushed to Sebastian's face. He must be blushing. How had he not grown out of that? The man was wearing a uniform, likely the golden stripes that decorated it displayed the exact rank. He sighed. To Spain? India. And I imagine you are going to the ball. I am. Are you? Sebastian realized he was holding his breath, eager for their conversation to continue. Energy pulsed through him, and he felt alive. The stars sparkled above as if to amplify the moment. I wouldn't miss it. William smiled, meeting his gaze. I'm joining my sister there now. Sebastian nodded. How nice you have a close relative here. London can be a bit overwhelming. William grinned. That's because you attempt to climb all the trees. I'm in the middle of Grosvenor Square, no less. Sebastian smiled. If you hadn't startled me, then nobody would have caught you. The corners of Sebastian's lips rose. Perhaps William had a point. Anyway, William continued, I've been finding the place rather dull. 
Sebastian shifted his feet. Of course William wouldn't find London overwhelming. The prospect of losing his life no longer hung over him now he was not at war. They edged nearer to the wall, silent. In moments they would separate, each making the rounds of the crowded social event. Sebastian didn't like the idea of spending any more time in London society than duty necessitated. The dancing and the small talk were not horrible to contemplate, but he didn't mind the dewy looks he received from the women. Devoting much of his time to outside pursuits had given his body an athleticism they appreciated, and his blonde hair curled naturally, lending him a fashionable air. A widower with a tragic past seemed endearing to the women, and he sometimes wondered if she should be gazing at them in a similarly besotted fashion. William halted, looking uncertain, and then Sebastian paused. For my peace of mind, William said, let me get you a drink. I assure you, I don't go about my evenings knocking these gentlemen off their feet. I spotted a tavern further back. Why don't we go there? Sebastian nodded, surprised by William's suggestion, and conscious of disappointing his aunt if he arrived late. Still, even if he were introduced belatedly to his future wife, once they wed, they would have a lifetime together. He saw no reason to hasten the meeting. William and he wouldn't have much of a chance to speak once they entered the teeming ballroom. They departed the square, Sebastian's heart racing. So, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thank you again, um, Simply Sexy and Mark. Um, bye!